so what I want to do is speak very quickly for the allotted 15 minutes and uh, stimulate the discussion on the role of nuclear energy and the U.S.'s future energy needs, and uh, in particular, uh, the role of, uh, or the scale of the nuclear waste problem that will have to be, be addressed. Now, the, the motivation during the last uh, decade for really looking very carefully at nuclear energy has been uh, the um, carbon cycle and the impact of uh, CO2 emissions from burning uh, uh, fossil fuels on the uh, earth and the uh, resulting change in climate. Uh, the, the point I want to make is this is a chart or a, a diagram of the carbon cycle from over a decade ago. And at that time, we were emitting something like 5.4 gigatons of carbon per year. Uh, since that time, not much has changed except that now we're uh, uh, emitting something uh, uh, on the scale of greater than 8 gigatons per, per year. Okay? So the, problem is getting worse, it's getting worse uh, uh, quickly. And so one looks for sources of energy that we're already using and that we're convinced are well demonstrated and that we can uh, use to replace, say, a coal-powered plant. So my nuclear colleagues, of course, would say, well, let's just build nuclear power plants uh, because that's uh, a source of energy that doesn't emit uh, uh, greenhouse gases. The problem is that when we replace that uh, fossil fuel uh, powered plant with a nuclear power plant, we bring with it the entire fuel cycle. And so the, the complete analysis of how wise it is to use nuclear power requires a, a pretty detailed understanding of the uh, uh, fuel cycle. I use this slide because if you uh, follow around the steps of the fuel cycle, what you will see missing is that there's no repository for nuclear waste. And this is pretty typical of the nuclear community. That is, for quite a long time, the concerns for what to do with nuclear waste were neglected. Okay? It was set, as a, set aside as a problem and with the idea, we'll solve that when the time comes. Okay? Well, the time has come, and I'll show you some of the difficulties. The other point with the, the nuclear fuel cycle is that you can see we can extract energy from uh, natural uranium, but we have the possibility of recycling some of the things we create while that fuel is in a reactor. And for this reason, it's uh, uh, important to, or, or the type of analysis we'll want to do is to ask the question, well, for Nuclear fuel cycles, and, I, and it's plural because we have already in this very simple diagram several possibilities. For the different nuclear fuel cycles, what would be the scale, what would be the type of fuel cycle we would need to have an impact on the carbon cycle? Okay? It's just a simple cartoon, but it's, I think, captures the, the sense of the problem. Uh, you just can't take the nuclear fuel cycle, drop it in place of a fossil a uh, fuel power plant, and, you're, and then you're finished. You have to ask yourself whether, how, much, how many nuclear power plants you'll need, what types of, of fuel cycles you'll want to, to create. And the different fuel cycles depend very much on what happens inside the reactor. And I won't discuss this in, in detail, but just uh, to, to mention that it's the uranium-235 isotope that we fission in most reactors. Uranium-235 is not very abundant. Less than 1% of the uranium in the ground is uranium-235. We fission it with uh, slow neutrons, and we get a bimodal distribution, the, halves, the two halves of the uh, uranium nucleus, of fission product elements. And these are highly radioactive. Hundreds are generated, many hundreds are generated in a nuclear reactor. Fortunately, most have very short half-lives. So over the longer term, it's uh, fewer than 10 uh, radionuclides from the fission products uh, that we have to deal with in terms of nuclear waste. And in fact, 
nuclear waste consists mainly of these fission product elements. The other point is the more abundant uranium-238 in this neutron flux is converted to plutonium-239. And for a nuclear engineer, this is good news because you can fission the plutonium-239 and generate energy. And in fact, for most light water reactors, about a third of the energy generated is by, comes from fissioning the plutonium-239 that grows into to the fuel. The downside of producing plutonium-239 is that it can be used to make weapons. And from an environmental point of view, plutonium is not an element that you want released to uh, the environment. And so it's the plutonium that really, and how you manage it, that really dictates the type of fuel cycle you select and how you evaluate uh, the environmental impact of, of nuclear power. Now, for the United States, we have had uh, two fuel cycles, uh, one in which we create um, uh, energy in commercial light water reactors, and the other fuel cycle has been associated with reactors that produce plutonium for weapons or reactors that uh, drive our uh, uh, nuclear uh, navy. This fuel cycle from the mining of the uranium through milling it, enriching it in uranium-235, and then generating either energy or weapons creates waste at all the different uh, stages. You have uranium mine and mill tailings from uh, the first step of mining and milling the uranium. Uh, from uh, the enrichment plant, you have, your, remember you're enriching in uranium-235. We have, we generate weapons, but we also then generate depleted uranium. Uh, today, both the depleted uranium and the weapons are waste streams, that is, I'll show you in a moment, we're dismantling weapons. And so red arrows represent waste, and now what used to be not considered to be waste, weapons and depleted uranium, uh, these should be uh, red arrows. In our defense uh, programs, we, uh, by reprocessing the fuel, extracting the plutonium, then we end up with high-level waste, which are all those fission products in that bimodal distribution. And then when we make weapons, we create a lot of true transuranic waste, which is just materials, lab materials, uh, uh, equipment used to handle the, the plutonium. So we have the high-level waste, the spent fuel, um, uh, high-level waste, the transuranic, uh, uh, the high-level waste from reprocessing fuels to um, make weapons, transuranic waste, low levels of activity, contaminated material, the depleted uranium now requires disposal, and dismantled nuclear weapons require disposal. If you try to put all of this on a single slide to get some idea of the scale, it's interesting to continue to consider the volumes of contaminated material and the amount of radioactivity. So uranium mine and mill tailings, that's about 3 billion curies of activity that we have to deal with. Of this 3 billion curies, it's important to realize 90, 95% have half-lives less than 50 years. Okay, so it's a moving target over time. This, the uranium mine and mill tailings are distributed through a huge volume of material compared to the high-level waste from uh, reprocessing uh, uh, fuel to reclaim the plutonium, that's only 2.4 billion curies, which I shouldn't say only, that's a lot of, of, of curies, but it's less than what we have in uranium mining mill tailings, but concentrated in a much smaller volume. In terms of the greatest source of activity, some 40 billion curies, that's the used or spent fuel from commercial power reactors. So if you want to have the largest impact from a waste management point of view, one would look at the spent fuel from commercial reactors, the contaminated soil and water, this is mainly from our defense programs, cleanup and disposal cost will be at least $3 billion, just about equivalent to what are the cost of, uh, the cumulative cost of our weapons program. 
So we're paying a heavy price for the weapons that we created, and we're paying it annually now. Uh, well, the price will be a heavy burden for you. It's about $5 billion per year uh, in, in this activity. What are the projections for the commercial fuel? Uh, this, these are the projections. Now we're at about uh, 70,000 metric tons. Okay. And it's projected probably with reactor renewals to go to about 130,000 metric tons of spent fuel. Now, spent fuel is interesting. It's these uh, small pellets of uranium dioxide, approximately a, cent a centimeter across. And if any of you are a material scientist, it's fascinating because in the reactor, with all the things that happen to the fuel and with the fissioning process, only about 4% of the fuel is changed in composition. That is, for a typical burn-up, you end up with about 3% uh, 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 fission products, all of the, this complex chemistry, and about 1% the actinides, mainly uh, uh, plutonium. With that small change in composition, uh, the activity increases by a factor of a million. The activity decays with time, and at longer times, it's the actinides, remember the plutonium and uh, associated transuranium elements that contribute to the activity. So, in fact, what's really, uh, uh, for me, very interesting about the problem, you know, if you're disposing of carbon, it's just carbon. But with radioactive waste, the inventory changes as a function of time, as does the radiotoxicity and the geochemistry of, of the elements. Now, what are we going to do with this uh, waste? In the U.S., we have an open fuel cycle. We go through the fuel cycle, burn the fuel in a reactor, and it goes to a geologic repository. In the United States, we've spent $15 billion in 20 years working on uh, a potential repository at Yucca Mountain, uh, which may or may not uh, go forward. That's a highly politicized uh, issue. Other countries uh, and the U.S. and its defense programs used a closed fuel cycle where you use chemical processing to reclaim the uranium and plutonium, but those high-level waste uh, would also go to a geologic repository. And in our defense programs at uh, three sites around the country, those high-level waste shown here are kind of a a mixture of uh, crud and fluids stored in very large tanks. Uh, at the Hanford site, I think 179 tanks. A number of them are leaking because they weren't expected to contain the waste for, for so long. At any rate, this material needs to be solidified and go to a geologic repository. Uh, Yucca Mountain was also the site. Yucca Mountain is complicated. From a, if you're a geoscientist and you look at predicting over the scale of a million years, time scale of a million years, the behavior of fuel stored in the mountain above the water table with changing climates and pretty rapid uh, flow rates through the mountain, that was a, has been and remains a huge uh, uh, challenge. Of course, it's in the repository that the fuel cycle that I've shown you schematics of, intersects the natural geochemical and hydrologic cycles. And that's then the, the, our goal would be to compare the exposure from uh, the repository with the exposure from just the normal operating, normally operating uh, fuel cycle. So um, to, to stay with the cartoon, we have the carbon cycle. We want to impact it with uh, different nuclear fuel cycles. But then we have to look at the geochemical and hydrologic cycles. Now, a bit of good news in all of this is uh, the world in the early 80s, uh, we got to the point of having nearly 70,000 nuclear weapons. Okay? Uh, thanks to a series of treaties, mainly between uh, former Soviet Union, now Russia, and the United States, uh, that has been dramatically uh, uh, the number of weapons has been dramatically reduced. And so uh, we have, uh, as a problem, the issue of what to do with the excess weapons plutonium. 
And if you watch the news and maybe read the second page, you'll find that this is a highly controversial issue right now where the Department of Energy uh, uh, 20 years ago decided, well, we'll put it into a reactor and extract the energy and by irradiating it, make it non-weapons usable. But that hasn't panned out. And so um, uh, their alternatives are being considered. So that's the weapons inventory. That's this horizontal red line. We have about 250 metric tons of plutonium in weapons, but we've separated and it's stored in different uh, levels of, at different levels of safe, safety, uh, some 250 metric tons from commercial power plants. So the weapons plutonium and the plutonium from commercial power plants, it's been separated, they're at about the same uh, scale in terms of uh, the amount of material. And so to do the complete analysis, one has to be informed and of and, and uh, think about nuclear weapons production. What do we do with our weapons inventory? How do we control it? If we're lucky enough to, to uh, begin to dismantle nuclear weapons, we've created a new and challenging waste stream. Very quickly, what's the status of uh, disposal or the back end of the fuel cycle in the United States? Well, I mentioned Yucca Mountain. Uh, it's a high, it's a, a politically polarizing issue. At the moment, there's no clear uh, way forward for geologic disposal in the U.S. Because we don't have a place to put the fuel, and uh, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act required the federal government to take ownership of that fuel in 1998, the utilities, as a, essentially to compensate them for the extra cost, uh, receive a half billion dollars a year for hanging on to that fuel uh, at the various reactor sites. The vitrification plant, the plant that would have been used to solidify that high-level waste from the tanks, uh, it's uh, well behind schedule, well over budget, uh, and a number of storage tanks continue to leak. We had an operating geologic repository at the waste isolation pilot plant in New Mexico, southeastern New Mexico. It's now closed because of a Valentine's Day uh, accident, really two accidents that released uh, activity. That cost will be probably at least a half billion dollars and the repository will be closed for several years. The plutonium disposition program, I mentioned it, we were going to uh, create a fuel that could go back into reactors. It's well behind schedule, well above budget and DOE considers alternatives, most prominent uh, of which is to dilute the plutonium make it look like transuranium waste and dispose it in the repository, which is now closed because of the accident, okay? If you're interested in this subject, let me um, um, advertise a meeting that we'll have September 30th and October 1st. You can Google um, uh, CSAC, the Center for, Interna uh, Center for International Security and Cooperation. You're very welcome. And more importantly, we need uh, students to act as scribes and take notes. So if you're interested in doing that uh, for a day or two, uh, please let me know. And then in the uh, winter quarter, I teach uh, uh, a course on energy systems and their environmental impact. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Yes. Dave, I'm at the law school, um, and from Canada. You painted a fairly grim picture, but I'm wondering if you can um, relate it to small modular reactors and how that picture might change with nuclear waste with small modular reactors. I've heard talk about storing it on site, right underneath the reactor over the long term. Can you speak to that at all? Uh, a little bit. So small modular reactors, uh, uh, have been very much in the news for at least the last five years, maybe a little longer. And as the phrase suggests, they're small, uh, modular meaning we would print them out uh, one after the other with much the same design. And some of the aspects involved uh, uh, never having to refuel them. You would have the, you would build the reactor, load it with fuel, run it, and then close it down in place, okay? The challenges uh, that have, I would say, come to the fore as, as people have pursued this attractive possibility uh, 
is first the regulatory aspects of, of uh, dealing with a very different reactor design. Um, so this would be a major issue for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to address. And also the idea that you just leave the fuel at the reactor site. Uh, we now have, uh, we've been doing that because we don't have a repository in the United States. And so we have in at least 35 states and about 75 locations, reactor fuel stored at the reactor site because there's no place to put it. And I think it's fair to say that no one likes that solution, right? There's a strong driving force to move it to permanent uh, disposal uh, uh, position. So the possibility of having modular reactors running them and walking away is not entirely attractive. Okay. Yeah? Okay, so the French um, use a closed fuel cycle, uh, a decision they made uh, decades ago uh, for technical as well as political uh, uh, reasons. Uh, Charles de Gaulle wanted uh, uh, his force to frop, yeah, and so their military and, and power production uh, nuclear efforts are somehow all blended. As I said, they have a closed fuel cycle, so they reprocess at La Hague. Uh, they transport the reclaimed plutonium to the south of France and make a mixed oxide fuel, and they burn that fuel in, in their reactors, or at least, at least plan to. So the amount of energy that um, comes from nuclear in France, probably it was in, at its peak at 70 to 80 percent. The present government wants to diversify a little bit, so their goal is to get it down to, to 50 percent. So that's an example, I would say, of all things considered a successful program. They're developing a repository, which will be in clay, uh, in eastern France, but it required our, our, let's say, it's successful because there's a national energy policy. You know, there's a, there was a decision that nuclear would be a major contributor to energy and to their weapons program. Once you have that decision, then it's easier to move forward. In the absence of such a decision, it's maybe a little more difficult. Yeah? Okay, so that's a, that's a very important and interesting question. And so you can manipulate the fuel cycle, of course. You can even transmute some of the long-term fission products, at least from a, a physics point of view. But the fact of the matter is that every time you have a fission event, you get that bimodal distribution. So having it closed or open doesn't change the scale of the problem very much. What it changes is the demand for uranium. So if you believe that our uranium resources are limited, then recycling becomes important. If you don't believe they're very limited, then it's not so important. And if under each cycle you fission the same amount, you'll end up with the same waste problem, less some of the plutonium. Yeah, at the back. Are there any successful stories of you know, storage of the end, end product fuel uh, uh, at, uh, Around the world, at the moment, there is no operating geologic repository for the disposal of spent fuel or high level waste. Probably in Finland, within a decade, that may happen. So, so in the U.S. we store it on site. There's a, a strong push in recent uh, policy changes to have centralized interim storage. In France they reprocess the fuel and uh, create the vitrified high-level waste for disposal finally in a repository. Uh, the plutonium goes into this mixed oxide fuel. In Russia, uh, they uh, uh, have, well, they have waste, I have to think of my Russian colleagues, 
they have a huge problem. They have it on site. They've, they've had reprocessing. Um, and, and so uh, some of the reprocessing activities created waste as well. So um, they're dealing with something more on the scale of what we have in the U.S. in terms of the problem. Yeah? How is transportation So, uh, of course, the transportation gets everyone's attention because when you, you know, if you think about transporting fuel from Illinois to Nevada, uh, all of the communities along the route become very interested in, in, in whether you pass by their communities or not. So the, the risk analysis takes, takes many forms. So you can ask, well, how much exposure is there for successful transport of waste? Actually, it's, you know, it drops off as the inverse square of uh, the distance, so, and the material's heavily shielded. So in this case, the answer is not much risk, um, although people argue about that. Uh, more interesting is the question of accidents. Is it better in the truck or on a, on a rail transport? If you need rail transport, do we have tracks that go from where we have the waste to where we want it to be? Um, some of the challenges now is the on-site storage is in casks that are huge, hundreds of thousands of pounds. And so that begins to get to the limit of what can be moved. So transportation is um, both a concern in terms of risk, accidents and normal exposure, but also just the physical process of moving highly radioactive material great distances in large canisters, that's a major challenge. Yeah, sorry. So, the, again, that's a good question. The answer is a little bit complicated. Part of the difficulty, in my opinion, just my opinion in the United States, is what the utilities do is separated from what needs to be done for disposal. The federal government has the responsibility for the disposal. The utilities just make power and save the fuel for the federal government. That process of just saving the fuel, the decisions you make affect the disposal options. And so in our capitalistic system, uh, we've put some uh, disincentives in the chain, the decision-making chain, which I think uh, uh, work against us. In terms of cost, uh, it's often discussed, but I've never seen a cost estimate that I would believe, right? Um, if you look at DOE facilities uh, that are being built, vitrification plants, uh, the MOX uh, plant in South Carolina, the estimates that were used in the initial decisions were, were very far off, okay? So maybe the, the and, and of course the cost depends on the commitment to the source of energy. You know, if you have a casual commitment and try to parse the cost out in, in strange ways, then the cost will, will go up. So I guess my present thinking is, one, we need energy. Cost doesn't matter too much. Whether it's a factor of 10 off or not is not, not so interesting. Uh, but with that uh, observation that we need energy, we need an energy policy that will then drive um, uh, a, a system of incentives and, and uh, uh, a change in scale that would make the cost acceptable. So, okay, uh, I don't know. I, there, uh, the beauty of nuclear reactions is, and it's a real beauty, there are lots of possibilities. So these standing wave reactors, uh, small modular reactors, they offer, from a physics point of view, lots of possibilities. And I wouldn't discount any of them, but simply observe it's very hard to get from the physics to a power plant. And that's been the, the challenge. Okay. okay, perfect timing. Let's thank uh, Professor Ewing again.